thanks for coming here. And I, I wanted to just address a couple of things. Can we just admit that war and violence is another form of design or planned obsolescence? And you know, we're in a state here in a position in the world where we have an abundance of water, but we've also poisoned and you know taken a lot of risks with our survivability. Um, let's talk about how policies driven maybe by the marketplace have really uh, caused us to do development in places that were not sustainable, and we're trying to backtrack from that. But um, I mean, worldwide, we had this problem. So how do we readdress men's nature to kill one another? And are, are you kind of predicting that our own um, survivability as a human species is inevitably doomed? In answer to the latter question, no. I'm not proposing that at all. We lived the first two million years of the human experience in small communities close to the land. Did people kill each other? Oh, yeah. Uh, you only have to look at the invention of the flamethrower to understand that at some point somebody thought that was a good idea because it would kill people faster and more horrifically. I hate to invoke human nature here, but maybe, maybe we are programmed to go beyond defense and towards offense. Ron Pryor in the movie What a Way to Go, Life at the End of Empire, the most important film I've ever seen says that when a group contacts another group, one of three things happens. When, they, when, a, when a violent tribe comes onto a land held by another tribe, one of several things can happen. The violent tribe can quash and enslave the existing tribe, which allows the dominant paradigm of violence and destruction to persist. They can be rebuffed in war by that tribe, which allows the dominant paradigm of violence hierarchy to persist. Or they can kill them all or run them all off, which allows the dominant paradigm of violence and hierarchy to persist. That suggests that this paradigm of violence and hierarchy might be built into the system. We, at this point, are the most violent society in the history of the planet. The most unsettled set of living arrangements we could have developed is what we did. Is there a way out? I think there is one way out, and that's to stop living in an industrialized economy. Will we willingly go to a more durable set of living arrangements, such as characterized the first two million years of human experience? Derek Jensen has asked that question to thousands of members of his audience, and he has never had a single person raise their hand and say yes. Will we willingly go there? Will we voluntarily go to that set of living arrangements? Now, I don't know that he has many native peoples in his audience because a lot of First Nations or indigenous <coughs> people never left that set of living arrangements, despite the sparkly lights of a few dollars more. I, I don't know the answer to that question, except that uh, I can't imagine a more horrific, violent set of living conditions than we have right now. I, I can't imagine it getting worse if we change, even if, we, if the change comes unwillingly, involuntarily. And I'm an optimist. If we made the transition willingly or unwillingly to the lifestyle that you live, do you think human nature would lead us to develop once again into an industrial type society where we would start making the same types of problems with um, ex species extinction and things like that? I don't, I don't think so, because where I live we value compassion more than money. We value life over death. People can do that. In addition, we're past peak for everything that really matters to civilization, to industrialized society, so I don't think we can build an industrialized base again. We passed the world oil peak, we're at or near the world coal peak, we passed the world uranium peak in 1980. We're, we're past peak production of food, I mean, everything we think we need, we passed peak silver many years ago, peak gold as well, peak phosphorus, and so on. Everything we need think we need to
to feed all of these people in this set of living arrangements. That's all expensive now. I don't think we can rebuild starting from scratch, fortunately. Are you going to ask the question she was trying to ask that I never figured out what it was because I'm still going to figure it out. I'm just telling you. Um, I wanted to ask a related question. <clears throat> but actually, um, I keep getting this wrong. If um, if I can explain the way that I read her question, it's that we live in. Um, I, have a, I have a hard time speaking in public. Um, we live in a society where there's already a lot of racial and class stratification, and we're already faced by lack of resources. People in cities especially people of color and poor people in cities are already living in third world conditions. And let's get over the white guy, well, your perception of the white guy guilt trip, because that's not, I don't think, what either of us are trying to do. But you have the ability to go out and live you know, in a rural community. And I have the ability to travel to one and work in one and learn lots of great skills. Um, but not everyone has the ability to do that. Not everyone has access to those. To I have access to a car. You know, I have access to a lot of things to go do that. I think what my friend was getting at was how would you advocate as a society that we deal with access to resources in order to make a transition into more durable, sustainable communities? Uh, at the level of a global or national society. Um, I would think of it being national or regional. Well, we don't, because our national leaders are interested in getting what we think we need to sustain our industrial economy. They are not interested in redistribution of wealth. They're interested in bombing the Middle East and Northern Africa to get oil. Okay, well then let's talk about it at a community level. Like, you're speaking in Muskegon, which is a very racially mixed city. It, everything in the future is going to be local, so let's tackle things at a local level. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, we're we're going to have to have a huge amount of creativity in the years ahead, and we know better than to go back to systems that contributed to the building of this culture. So we need not go back to slavery. We know better than that and particularly slavery based on race. Will we willingly work together? Well, it's interesting, because de Tocqueville thought so. He thought that's what made Americans exceptional, actually. And Dmitry Orlov, in his wonderful book, Reinventing Collapse, the Soviet Example in American Prospects, compares the two superpowers and concludes that the Soviets were better prepared for collapse than the United States on every axis, and he compared dozens of them, except one. On one axis and one axis alone, the United States has a citizenry that is better prepared for collapse than the Soviet Union was. And that axis is our ability to work together in the face of catastrophe. According to him, Soviets would just as soon slit their throats as work together for the, for the good of a group. In my experience, when there's a catastrophe in this country, people run to it. They don't run away from it. They try to help. So, I think, without a, invoking American exceptionalism, that we will rally together, put our shoulders to the wheel when it matters at the local level. That's our history. If you know your neighbors, you're going to be in a lot better shape to do that than if you don't. So I would suggest you get to know your neighbors. A longtime colleague of mine, a professor at Oklahoma State University, sent me a Facebook message yesterday. He just wanted to share with me that he's, he's probably the most liberal person in all of Stillwater, Oklahoma. He wanted to share with me that his um, neighbor, who he describes as extremely conservative, 
comes over across the fence one day and says, hey, do you mind if I get some chickens? Uh, and they're going to be a little loud, and I, I don't want to disrupt the neighborhood. And my friend Sam says, no, chickens would be great. That would be fun. And this guy says, because, you know, this whole shit's coming down pretty soon, and we're going to need to grow our own food in this community. So Sam says, get you a beer. Let's come on into my house. And so they talked about collapse and developing good neighborly relations. These are two people who, under normal circumstances, wouldn't have a beer together, we'll say. But they're interested in developing good neighborly relations and getting through what is bound to be a difficult time in the years ahead. That's a pretty good attitude to have. I suspect I avoided the question again. But. I had actually my own different question. Um, which is, have you ever read anything about, or do you know anything about the capacity of what wilderness and what rural land base, what, whatever we have left in the United States, um, what ability that has to support more people? In a primitivist sense? <laughs> in a horticultural sense, okay. like a small agriculture sense? Yes. Yes, currently the way we grow food in this country, depending on whether you're a vegetarian or not, requires three to five acres to feed each person. So industrial agriculture requires three to five acres to feed each person. High intensity organic gardening, which is what I do, can support four to six people per acre. It's roughly a 20-fold increase in efficiency. So. If we stop growing at scale, which benefits big ag, and start growing gardens, which benefits us, because it produces healthy food, then we can feed us all. That's, a, that's easy. That's a no-brainer. If we're willing, we can grow the food. I, encourage, I strongly encourage you to get involved in the permaculture movement and the, the woman who organized this trip, Penny Freebill, writes at Little Arch Room, works at Little Arch Room, and she's a permaculture design specialist. She puts on courses. Permaculture is more than food growing. It's a design process that allows you to efficiently supply your food, maintain your body temperature, supply your water, and so on. All those things we need to thrive in any era are supplied by the permaculture movement. Pursue that and the transition town movement, and those two should be working together.